Um, uh, and yes, I'm coming from Brazil. I came in on, on uh, Friday to the Saturday. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. It was a great surprise to be invited. Uh, I should stress that at the beginning, I'm not an economic botanist. Uh, I'm not really even a botanist. When I started out in, in biology, I started out as a zoologist. And I used to work on beetles. And uh, then when I went to Brazil, uh, first of all, about 40 years ago, uh, I was studying beetles. Uh, I got very interested in plants. And I was kind of surprised how different it was to identify plants in the Amazon. Uh, I come from a society in Britain, I'm from Britain, obviously, um, uh, where there are field guides to everything. Field guides to nematodes almost in these days. And so uh, when I was in Brazil, I was very frustrated at not being able to identify plants. Uh, and uh, that sort of directed my life from then on. And I sort of merged into becoming a botanist and uh, have now been living in Brazil, in Amazonia, particularly in Manaus, for the last um, 25 years. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm pretty much a botanist now. Uh, I'm talking here about basic botany because I'm also a very frustrated botanist. Um, uh, and I will be talking in this talk, uh, which I sort of put together, it's very eclectic, uh, because uh, David said he wanted things about Amazonia. Uh, so I brought in uh, things of other people's work uh, into my talk, particularly ones associated with England. I expect most, many of you don't know the Amazon Research Institute, but it's a large research institute. Um, it has, it's deep has uh, 500, 700 employees. Um, uh, it's not a university, but we have a postgraduate program. Um, these days uh, the, the, we have trouble with recruitment, uh, we have trouble with finances, we have trouble with everything. Um, and so the, the number of employees is quite a lot lower than it was. Okay, so what happens when you get Dynamics in forest fragments. 
and also several important international collaboration programs on biodiversity, and uh, particularly these days, the best funded ones on things to do with uh, carbon balance, etc. But I won't be talking about those projects. There's a lot of things I won't be talking about. Some things I will be talking about. We'll go back a little bit in history now. Very interested in case talk, because there's a lot of parallels in the things that you were saying, and things that are uh, happening in Amazonia, but on a different scale. Um, uh, 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 in different ways. Um, Amazonia is very, very big. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I can't in this talk, uh, talk about everything I would like to when I was putting things together. I'm kind of shocked by how many things I cut out while I was preparing. But anyway, let's go back to the time of the invasion by the uh, uh, Europeans. Uh, the first guy to go down the Amazon was uh, Francisco Rezana. And then it, uh, I think everybody knows the accounts that he gave on the way down pointed to a very large population living along, at least along the main river. Uh, and his visit was the only one that was able to see these very large populations. When people went back a few years later, or a few decades later, they saw nothing like that. They saw uh, depopulated areas. And so a lot of these, the, 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 uh, the stories of my guess by the Catabell, but were thought to be largely inventions as the idea of the Amazons as female warriors is perhaps an invention. Uh, but uh, more recently, people are, are thinking that actually it's probably true. There probably was a very large population along the Amazon, and this is uh, being more and more enforced in, uh, in various ways. Unfortunately, Oriolama is not a botanist. Uh, it would have been really nice if he had uh, made some nice you know, botanical observations as he was going down the river, and made some nice plant collections, and that didn't happen for quite some time later. Um, what do we see? We do see evidence of the activities of the native people pre conquest. Uh, for example, uh, domesticated plants. There are 20, 30, maybe as many as 80 species of plants that have been domesticated, semi domesticated. Uh, I cited people who work in, but this is Charles Clement, an American botanist, agriculturist, really, a uh, horticulturist, who works, who works on the genetics of uh, Amazonian crop plants. So we have a, a large number of, especially fruits, but other things as well. Uh, we have evidence, uh, uh, which is kind of surprising recently, these ancient ruins that are turning up uh, when deforestation happens. People are beginning to see uh, areas where there was forest, and beneath the forest, are these structures that are rather difficult to interpret. They, as I understand it, it's not my area at all, that they're not actually villages, they're not actually fortified areas, they don't seem to be lived in. Maybe they had some ceremonial uh, 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 purpose. Uh, that one down in the bottom right looks to me rather like some kind of athletics field or sport. You <laughs> uh, see the, the uh, stadium that we have here, I think maybe it has a similar sort of function to maybe uh, college sports did. Uh, also, ancient field systems and ancient management, uh, land management practices, yeah? examples from the, the, the north of the base, of the, the way south as well. Uh, we don't see so much of this in the, in the middle of the Amazon, but the neighbors, because we don't have so much deforestation. Uh, these land practices were in part due to the flooding. Most of, a lot of Amazonia lowlands is seasonally flooded. Uh, and Possibly two simultaneous activities were happening here. One is uh, raising land so that you can have crops when they during the flooding season, uh, but also uh, creating uh, areas that are deliberately flooded, possibly for fish culture, which is something that, that perhaps was quite important in uh, pre-conquest societies. I'll talk about that a bit later. Another evidence of substantial uh, populations is the existence of these black earths. Black earths are uh, Amazonia traditionally, uh, or especially in the terra firma, away from the rivers, has very poor soil. Uh, but in certain areas, there was, they find this very dark soil, so you can see it, meaning several meters thickness here, uh, which uh, is an artificially created soil. Uh, there's been a great controversy about this about in the past, about whether this was in some way deliberately done, or whether this is totally accidental, just the, the remains of a rubbish, rubbish pit. Uh, I think it's pretty much accepted now that, uh, uh, that it certainly was used uh, active uh, uh, cultivation of a more fertile soil. Uh, in the past, it was uh, too much there of, of the recent uh, increase in knowledge of these uh, soils. Uh, they, they have been known along the main rivers for a while. 
uh, but their extent has been increased recent, recently with, with more studies on them. Uh, and also, you can see at the bottom there that the, it's not just on the main rivers, whereas the scientists have been visiting mostly the main rivers, if they've been going after tributaries as well, they would also have found extensive black earth patches there. Uh, so perhaps the argument that Oriana did see big villages, but they were only on the main river, uh, is probably false. Uh, probably the population was uh, considerably inland as well. Uh, you can see uh, a study by Carolina Levis here, one of our star students uh, recently, uh, who was studying the distribution of useful plants uh, uh, in relation to uh, archaeological sites and especially to rivers. Uh, and here's a, uh, you can see that as you get nearer to the river, the proportion of useful species increases, especially palms. Palms are extremely important in Amazonia. Uh, so that was a, uh, this uh, mapping here shows the sort of degree of influence uh, uh, of uh, human populations in uh, improving uh, the uh, economic uh, content of the forest. Uh, so that's along the main rivers. But if you can imagine this uh, extending uh, uh, as we now know it does on the smaller rivers as well. Effectively, basically, all the forest is altered by humans. Uh, so, uh, this uh, uh, idea that the human forest is not uh, an unmanaged, or at least was not an unmanaged uh, wilderness in the, world, uh, in the past, and that that's actually much of Amazonia, or most of Amazonia, or perhaps all of Amazonia, is actually, it tends to was intensively managed and supported quite a large, very large population, possibly large species today. Just a few shots of some of the many, many, many species of useful plants and their uses. Uh, okay, this is uh, uh, an extreme student of mine who's now uh, uh, a, a star in Brazil uh, for his work on packs, or pank, as it should be called. Uh, Plantus elegantis is non convincionax. Uh, uh, plants which are not usually thought to be uh, edible. Uh, he has uh, written a wonderful book which I thoroughly recommend. It's going into its third edition now. Uh, and it's uh, absolutely brilliant. Which is, it contains the botanical information about numerous, numerous plants from the forest and weedy plants and, uh, and, and recipes. And he has these uh, take photographs of the, the concoctions that he makes. Uh, there are several restaurants in Brazil that use many of the plants that he does now. He's, uh, 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 he's uh, uh, trendy. Uh, here's uh, another one of our researchers, uh, uh, Rizology, and uh, one of the field guides, uh, or a guide that he has uh, done with other workers as well, on uh, seeds, uh, seedlings, identification of seedlings. Uh, when I uh, went back to Brazil to live in 1993, I went back to coordinate this project uh, on the flora of Reserve Duty. Uh, the Duty Reserve is uh, a block of forest there on the outskirts of the mouse. In the past, it used to be a long way from the mouse, uh, but the city has grown to almost enclose it now. Um, and it is a block of forest that belongs to Inpa and uh, had received 40 years of research since the 1950s of people collecting plants there, uh, 7,000 collections in the Inca herbarium, and it was thought that it would be uh, a good time to do a field guide, a local field guide, or at least a, a list, complete listing of the plants and keys for people to identify, uh, so that we facilitate other kinds of research. And uh, for some reason they asked me to, it's me, it's me. <laughs> Uh, they asked me to organize it, and, and so I organized it. And we, it was a fabulous project because I had really good funding from the British government, as we paid at the time. Unfortunately, don't, there's no way that we would uh, fund this. It, it, it fell at a very convenient time. For some reason, we didn't have some money to spare. And for some reason, Margaret Thatcher wanted to have a more green image. So she approved this project that he in France, and in France had uh, conceptualized. Uh, and I had a very free hand in how I organized the project. And what I mostly did is I organized people. I organized a, a group of young Brazilian, uh, uh, mostly uh, postgraduate students or uh, recent graduates. Um, and, I had, and we had contacts throughout the world um, of uh, uh, professional botanists, professional taxonomists. Uh, and this, that's the 14, as it turned out, 40 authors of the book. There were more than 100 people involved altogether. 
Uh, here are some of the people. I would like to stress the importance in Brazil of Mateus. Now, oh, Toshiba here, as he's known, um, uh, is, uh, is an analphabet, but he's, sorry, he's uh, somebody who doesn't uh, read and write. Um, but he has an incredible knowledge of the forest um, through his work with uh, earlier projects and through his uh, um, knowledge from his, his uh, childhood. Uh, he and uh, uh, other uh, Mateos now, uh, uh, yeah, three of the authors there are uh, Mateos there, is Josh Sheeper, so he's an author of the book, although he, he cannot read or write, he's still an author of the book because their contribution was so important. Um, oops, Here are some of the two of the uh, young scientists who are involved, is Lucia Lowe, who is now a uh, very uh, uh, high powered um, professor at the University of São Paulo. Um, this is when she was 17, she was visiting the project, she was one of our authors. And Alberto Vincentini, uh, also a young Brazilian, is now a researcher. I think uh, many of the people who were involved in the project later became involved directly at Jimmy. And we had a very simple uh, methodology. And the methodology was we want to know what plants are growing in the conservative, <coughs> and we want to be able to find ways to identify them. So what we did was we looked out with the materials, and the, the young people, the young researchers there, they learned individual families, pretty much one by one. Uh, uh, and then we walked in the forest with the materials, and the material would say, we were working, today we're working on sapotasia. The material would say, that's a sapotasia there. And we'd say, well, how do you know that's a sapotasia? And he said, well, that's a sapotasia because it looks like a sapotasia. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so that's that kind of bark of sapotasia. Uh, so that tree over there, that's a sapotasia as well. And they would say, so I possibly think that's a sapotasia, nothing like a sapotasia. And, and so we actually, during this project, we spent a long time trying to learn what the materials were seeing, and then we could put that into a book so that other people could learn. Uh, but the, the basic thing was to try and find things that we didn't know where, where they were. The idea originally was uh, everything's been collected in the reserve, so it's just a botanical thing, we can work on the herbarium, work on the herbarium specimens. But we rapidly found that we were seeing plants that were not present in the herbarium. So we could turn it much more into a field project. And we turned much more into a field guide project. Uh, and we walked around looking for them to know what they were. Okay. And uh, we had a, it was a three year project that we ran for six years. And um, uh, during that time, one problem we have in Amazonia is that the trees don't flower all the time, they don't flower every year. So uh, it's difficult to collect good material. So if you have people working in the forest all the time, continuously, and they know what they're looking at and they know what we don't know, uh, they can uh, see things flowering. Uh, and, and collect them. So uh, that was basically our project there, it was the way that it worked. Um, and for me, it was phenomenally successful. Here's the, the book, part of the book. I had this book in PDF, it's out of print for a long time now, but uh, if anybody wants a PDF of it, they can give it to you. Um, find me sometime. So, uh, we, some of the pages there. It's not, it was not aligned to the flowers or fruits of the plants, because a lot of the time it was not possible to get good pictures. Uh, of, of the get pictures at all. Uh, it's a guide to more of the sterile characters. And the, the bulk of the book is like this. Every species has a, a, a bulk there. And they're organized in a sort of uh, color scheme thing. It's not, in, not using uh, dichotomous keys, because I am capable of using dichotomous keys. So they designed it in a way that's more visual, more like a, a, uh, the idea is more like a Peterson seal guide. Uh, and the, the, the species that look like a color are grouped near each other, and everything is photographed. The picture of the leaf there is exactly life size of that particular leaf. So when you want to ask yourself, does it look like, is it the species you can take a fresh leaf, double it, put it on the book, <coughs> and see if it looks like it's a mirror image of the photograph. And then pictures of the bark and a picture of the cut. Other details, a scan of the leaf, scan of the leaf, that can to help. Uh, and we also had an awful lot of fun in designing this book, in, in um, uh, trying to establish patterns in things like bark, dendrological uh, characters of the trees, of which there was very little work done previously. And we used this, this is our key system, which works on what we call bubble grounds, uh, where the intensity of the color is like you're going into a pit, and uh, everything inside the box has the characteristics of the thing outside it. So sort of, instead of doing a dichotomous thing, it's either this or this, sort of pushes you in, in a direction. Uh, and if you know some character, you can look at uh, which uh, something special about the margin of belief or, or the presence of Demacia, uh, you can find your, your uh, the, the most likely found in the book. Okay. Um, so, sort of the book. And uh, 
uh, one of the, so we produced this lovely book, um, but one of the surprises uh, was that we were working in a forest that was deliberately chosen because it was the best known forest in Amazonia. And, but when we actually studied it, we almost doubled the number of species that were known for this best known study. And we also found up to, to date it's about 70 new species of plant being described in the we made. It's continuing, there's still new, new uh, species uh, being described. Uh, maybe it gets 100 species. So for me, this is an amazingly efficient way of capturing the biodiversity of actually uh, doing biodiversity prospection to discover what species are present. And the uh, methodology, I think, is really important for this. The trouble is, it doesn't count as scientific methodology. What we're doing is just looking for new things. We don't work on areas, we can have a plot, we can collect everything in the plot. So a lot of more uh, traditional scientists, especially ecologists, look down on the work because it wasn't quantitative. Uh, so, but that sort of sentence thinking, that, um, I'll leave more than that. <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, so, if that is the result in the best known bit of forest in Amazonia, what's the rest of Amazonia like? Right? And so, there, there was already a model here of, uh, uh, showing very, very intensive uh, concentration collections in two places. There's another one that they did based on monographs. Uh, in colour there. Uh, I'll skip this, and I'm, I'm currently working on a project where we're trying to georeference every collection that's been made in the in the Lolo Amazon, and use that for modelling to try and model the, uh, uh, the, the the rate of discovery of the Amazon flora in space and time. It's uh, a project with, with a doctor at uh, the That's a preliminary habitat. You can see the distribution of collections, are obviously very. Uh, concentrated in a few areas, uh, often following roads or rivers, and often very large areas, totally unknown. Also, and some evidence here, I, 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 my thesis is that there are a huge number of species that have not been described yet, and that this is uh, complicating all scientific research in Amazonia because we do not have the best data, and we need that best data if we're really going to understand the ecosystem functioning, etc. Et uh, so, when you look at biological monographs, whether the, the some of the have made these maps for you very nice. And you see that they're spotted, they're always spotted. They never, in Amazonia, they never fill all the, all the spaces along the way from. And when you look in the herbarium, you see that most species, the commonest thing to be in the herbarium is very, very rare. Right? There are more species that have one single collection, basically, in any, um, any collection of Amazon plants than any other category of commons. A few, uh, apparently common species there, but many species that have been collected very, very rarely. Yeah? And this is the, the thing about a veil line. Uh, if I could have collected more, that graph would move towards the right, and more species would appear back here. So there's a number here to the left which has been collected zero times, yeah? and we don't know how many that is. Okay? And the same thing if you look in uh, botanical monographs, you look at the distribution of plants. Uh, how many spots are there? I mean, when somebody does a map, how many spots are there? How many, uh, we use a lot of this, this uh, unit of one, one degree of latitude and longitude. So how many squares of one degree of longitude and latitude, 100, 500 kilometers, is the plant collected from? And again, the commonest thing is to be collected from only one place. Yeah? A lot of people have this idea that Amazonia is a long, large, green vegetation. It's basically the same from one end to the other. Botanically, it is botanically. It's lots and lots and lots of species that have very limited distributions. Again, how many local species have never been seen by botanists? And if you look in botanical inventories as well, that's another problem. Because often uh, many species uh, do not, are not at all common where they do occur. Again, this is an inventory actually in reserve duty. And the commonest thing that's been known from maybe one single tree during a uh, large scale inventory project. How many species didn't appear? And the other thing, if you look over time, this is a graph, in this case, for South Asia. How many species for Amazonia did we know at that time, at that date? And you can see that this curve, you would expect it to be asymptotic. You would expect it to, at some point, there is a number there. Somewhere out there, there is a number that it will get to. But we don't see it. We can't see it's still, we're a long way off it. How many species have never been seen by that time? Okay. Here's a modeling that I did uh, a few years ago, uh, which is, uh, I don't have time to explain this, you have to read it, I'm great. One is uh, uh, 
what we actually know, okay, what we actually know that the documented, so that's the distribution of species, uh, what we know, and, and I did a, a modeling where I simply expanded the range, I filled in the dots between on distributions and expanded the range, and, and again counted how many species occur in each degree of latitude and longitude, and said, okay, this is maybe what we can explain. And then I did another modeling where I compared the checklist to adjacent uh, degrees of latitude and longitude and did some uh, mathematical modeling uh, to try and find a, uh, a distribution of biodiversity in general with a hypothetical way. So I have the hypothetical way that I can explain. So I think if I take explain away from hypothetical, that tells me what I don't know. So that last graph in the corner there is what we don't know. The, the deeper blue is the, the deeper are uh, uh, lack of knowledge of those areas, which, which is these basically these four areas. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, people are, there's a lot of investment in doing lists of rounds and plants. Now that uh, databasing, that uh, uh, data is available much more online, uh, there's uh, various projects that are putting together lists. Uh, this is one a Brazilian um, initiative, the River Water Project for Brazil, uh, which has uh, this number of species for Amazonia. Uh, increasing gradually, very gradually, along the time. Uh, and this is a, one preliminary result which shows the number of species for each Brazilian state. Okay, the green states there are states in Amazonia. The other states are in, uh, in, other, in the other colors are other states. So according to this graph here, the most botanically diverse state in Brazil is Minas Gerais, pretty much in the south of Brazil, and the state of Amazonas, uh, uh, which is huge, and we believe extremely diverse, apparently isn't as diverse. Okay? Uh, I, for me, this is totally enough, this is an artifact of collection density of uh, activity, botanical activity. Uh, any indice that you look at, of any index that you look at, uh, of botanical activity, of investment in botany, uh, of number of scientists per hectare, etc., uh, shows that there is a massive investment in the states of uh, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Minister Arts, especially, uh, in botanical work, and that they always has it. Whereas there is a massive deficit of botanical work in all of the Amazon states. And for me, this is totally an artifact. Um, we also have uh, studies like this one, which come from plot studies. This is uh, Jess Gehi, uh, who uh, uses mathematical modeling based on uh, permanent inventory plots to try to estimate the number of total number of species of Amazonia. And this is a result of a number of famous publications, like this one of that hyperdominance and giving a total there of about 16,003 species for Amazonia, of which about 6,000, 4 to 6,000 of them have yet to be described. Um, for me, uh, this is a publication that has uh, 120 authors, including quite a lot of my colleagues uh, at Geneva. Um, so for me, this is, I'm, I'm sorry to use the word, but for me, it's a uh, it's one thing is extrapolating of, on the basis of a mathematical formula across all of Amazon, treating it as if it was a uh, green carpet of plants that it doesn't really change much from one place to another. Uh, and it's also based entirely on inventory plots. When I know that the, the confidence in good botanical identification in inventory style plots, where you're working with sterile plants in areas where you do not have a uh, style flora, uh, the chance of getting a good identification, especially since the identification is generally not done by professional botanists, taxonomists, usually done by students, or etc. Probably the chance of getting a right identification is probably lower than 50% on any of the plants. Uh, so personally, I think this is entirely an artifact. And we also, uh, on this stage, we've also got a whole publications in Nature. Uh, uh, here we one listing the plants, and that was uh, considered to be an exaggeration by uh, most of the botanists in Amazonia. Uh, they reduced his number of trees from 11,000 to 6,000, to 7,000. Uh, and Testeji et al. gave a, a, a re evaluated their things and reduced their, their list by almost 2,000. Um, but for me, both of these are totally wrong. They're probably both now by a factor of about 20,000 species. Okay. So anyway, this is one of the ways that I was modeling this, looking at that thing I've told you over time. We do not have, we can't see the total number of species because the people aren't have the topic. So what can we do? If you look at the, uh, uh, when, if I take that, that curve there, oops, take that curve there, that's all species. If I say 
some of those species are widespread. Some of those species have very local groups, and they separate them. You can see that the widespread species, the ones that go 30 or more degrees squared, yes, we know them. And that the, the more relatively rarer they are, the more the less asymptotic is occur, the more logarithmic is occur. And so if you take into account that actually very few species have wide distributions, and many species have very local distributions, and if we think about what could happen in the future, if we made more, more collections, we probably won't find any more of these white stone species, but the rest we should find a very, very large number of new species. And in my thesis is that if we collected more, the results of the that counting the first state project would look more like that. But how much more? And where are they? Are we going in the right direction? Here's data from the England area. You can see the tendency of a tendency of uh, collecting uh, quantity of collections in kind there, and uh, largely this big uh, mountain in the middle is part of the in France again, his own collections and the uh, Project de Flora and Sonica project. After that, we have this massive decline in unhappy bosses. And now we maybe we're making a small current here, we don't think that's going there, just to show you in France again, also two of the most, uh, most important uh, botanists in Amazonia. Also, Peter's in the William Rodriguez. Uh, and this is a uh, modeling project. Now, one other thing I was thinking about we can look at how the number of, how our knowledge of the uh, Amazon floor is changing over time. Right? Each of these lines is one degree squared in Amazonia uh, over time. And how many species do we know? And what you can see is that there's a huge number of degree squares there, but it's all down in the corner there, where we don't have much knowledge and it doesn't have much time to increase. There are very few there that increase, but basically these are the main have time to go into that. And if you look at the uh, uh, species uh, accumulation curves with number of collections, you can see that there we also don't have, maybe we have asymptotes in two of the most collected squares, but other squares, the other the most common ones, nothing like asymptotes, going up and up and up. Okay, uh, and here, Uh, uh, yeah, uh, how can we model that? How can we sort of quantify it? How behind are we? How much do we have to catch up in one uh, We would like to see curves like that. What we do see is curves like that. Very hard to compare. But what I can compare uh, here is, uh, is compare how much do we know, at what point in time do we get 50% of the knowledge of the flora that we know today? Okay, this will be a very, very gross underestimate of the of the, I can, I can, this I can put a number, I can put from the number, I can put a date on it. So I can use that for say, how many years behind are we in comparison with other areas. So if I do that for the five major regions of Brazil, green is Amazonia there, and I do my thing there, and I do my number, I see that Amazonia is 65 years behind the rest of Amazonia, as an absolute minimum estimate. Probably the estimate is 100 years or more. So we're working in Amazonia with a flora that we have a knowledge that we knew about in the ocean era at the beginning of the 19th century. Okay, so, this is so we have a lot of catching up. Doesn't happen. But this, so, uh, in work that's been done in Amazon, we trust the results from Amazon. Personally, I don't, uh, for, for, in the, for, for ecological studies using it. In our academics and our fact, I think they certainly are. If we think about economic property, rational management of the forest, sustainable use of the forest, identification is absolutely the fundamental. In Amazon, you have many species that are very similar. Um, they perhaps have the same wood qualities, but in many areas, you have some that are common and some that are rare. If you treat the rare ones as if they were part of the population of the common ones, which is what happens today, then you you decimate the rare species that can be selected against. Also, obviously, for uh, patenting, which we hope will be uh, uh, useful in Amazonia in the future, uh, uh, it's very important to have accurate taxonomic names. It's very difficult to give them at the moment. Um, what I would like to see, and what I thought was obvious to me when we finished the Duke project, I thought there would be massive investment in other projects similar to that one. And it was a great surprise to me that it didn't happen. Why not? They're perceived to be expensive. Yeah. And uh, they're also perceived to not have an immediate return. So they don't have a financial <laughs> investment. They say, whoa, ah, well, we made money back. 
uh, and uh, the investment goes more to insecticides, uh, which is those higher level things which include the inventories, include the uh, work of SDG, which is really different, easy to publish in science, in nature, in these very high level journals, where a taxonomic work, uh, there are no high level uh, taxonomic journals. Uh, and botany is considered to be something that, uh, taxonomic collecting botany, something way out of fashion more than 100 years ago, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and so this is what I consider the pyramid of how things should be. We should have uh, good investment at the, at the base, we should have good collection so that we can do good taxonomy, so that we can understand ecosystems and so we can manage ecosystems. The tendency in the, in the uh, funding world is to do exactly the opposite, is to invest very, very little at the base, uh, and, uh, invest more on sector things at the top, and for me, this results in instability, and obviously non-sustainable. Uh, what I would like to see, uh, sorry, just to summarize some of the, uh, what I would like to see is more involvement of local people in the main procuring knowledge of plants. This is a, a, a traditional uh, thing that happens in expeditions, botanical expeditions into Amazonia. A group of taxonomists go into the field, they collect plants, they take them out of the field, send them to taxonomists to describe it. Uh, and the local people are not very happy about this. Uh, so that. Uh, permanent plot models do involve local people, some of them are happy. Uh, but the quality of the material that's collected does not get into the variant, it's not of, of much use to taxonomists, and so the botanists are not happy. If we could develop a model that involves the local people living in the forest to make the collection and use the external botanical community as a service to them, for them to get a return to know what the local biodiversity is, everybody would be happy. So we can see this is the way that we did the, the, the Reserve Duty project, but involving local communities. Problems in involving local communities are, uh, uh, it's difficult. Uh, Amazonia is difficult, everything is difficult, logistically it's difficult, it's difficult, it's very difficult to get the long-term funding that's necessary, very difficult to get the dedicated individuals in the communities and uh, also people to manage those in the communities. So uh, uh, I've been trying for this floor for about 20 years now and I haven't really got very far. Uh, here's a nice example though uh, of how I would like to see this done. This is an example of the fungi, the Animani, uh, uh, a group of people who depend very much on fungi, they'll make from the uh, community in Brazil at least now. And here's Davi uh, Kopnawa uh, with uh, Noemi Ishikawa, who's a researcher in India. Uh, and uh, this is absolutely the, the quote that she, she puts in here. They so were researching a book on the use of uh, fungi by the animal. Uh, and he sees scientific knowledge as a way of preserving the territory. Ah, wonderful. Uh, this is the, the book that she produced, uh, in Yama Nama, and Portuguese. And this is a story that came out of this, interestingly enough. The Yama Nama, this is exactly what I'd like to be seeing happening. The Yama Nama wanted to know, what is this thing that we're using in our basket? This uh, fiber. They really didn't know what it was. It's actually a fungal rhizome. And it's there and there. And so uh, they, uh, uh, as it were, contracted Noemia and the specialists in this kind of fungi, uh, to go there and make the collections, etc. That's a new species. Species that was not described previous, uh, being described this week as Marathmius Yanma. This is just a lovely story. I've tried to work into in, in communities in the interior. This is the Chituawa village in Oraima, where I've for years. But it's very, very difficult in the, in the academic, the financial structure, uh, the logistic structure that we have in Amazonia to actually really do something long term. I would like to I have to say that I have not really felt that I had much success. Uh, just to show some of our students together with Ian Parks, I'd like to draw attention to Ian Parks there in the middle, in the tie, and next to him, uh, Jose Hans, who is uh, Mateo, who's worked with France for 45 years, I think now, and is the, uh, has collected more plants in Amazonia than any other person ever. Um, and some of our lovely students.
Brazil.